welcome Lisa Gerardin. She is a park ranger at Acadia National Park, and she's here to tell us all about uh, Acadia's amphibians and reptiles. Welcome, Lisa. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and uh, a few um, logistics before we jump in and get started. I think you've already been reminded just to bring a piece of paper and a pencil because we're going to be doing some fun drawings today. And I'm going to ask you to hold on to those questions of what during our drawing times, we are going to be able to have our question time as well. So I want to jump right in here and um, kind of get started. Let me bring this up for you. Hold on just a moment. And you should be seeing the first thing I'm going to show you is a map of the United States. I want to give you a sense of where I am in Acadia National Park. So Acadia is located on the coast of the state of Maine. Now, we're not the only national park. There's over 400 national park sites across the entire country. Now, along here, the, along the coast here, Acadia, of course, is right next to the Atlantic Ocean, and we're mostly on island lands. And all of us park rangers across the country wear this awesome badge on our uniform to remind us of the amazing resources that we preserve and protect in our national parks. This gives you a sense of some of the landscape and habitat here in Acadia. It's such a beautiful place and a great place to explore. So today we're going to be focusing on these fun animals. They're some of my favorites uh, for our program called the Reptiles and Amphibians of Acadia. I am so excited about this program. All I got to say is yay. If you like reptiles and amphibians, you can say yay as well. Now, the reptiles that live in Acadia National Park are snakes and turtles. There are other reptiles in other parts of the world, uh, but we don't have those here. And that would include animals like lizards, alligators, and crocodiles. The amphibians that we have in Acadia National Park are the salamanders and the frogs and toad. So first of all, let's ask some questions. We're gonna think about how all of these animals are alike and how are they different? So let's think about what do they all have in common? So first of all, Let's take a look here. Oh, they are all vertebrates. That means they all have a backbone and you can actually reach back and feel your backbone as well. So that's something we have in common in that we're all vertebrates. Secondly, all of the animals you see on the screen here are ectothermic. A nickname for ectothermic is cold-blooded. I say nickname because their blood is not really always cold. Ectothermic just means their body temperature is controlled by the outside air temperature. The last thing that these animals here have in common is that they mostly, most of them lay eggs. You'll hear me say words like most and usually because there are always some exceptions to the rules. All right, so now we're gonna think about how reptiles and amphibians are different. And we are gonna have a little workout time. We're really gonna work out our minds here uh, to play a little game. So I'm gonna put reptiles on one side of the screen and amphibians on the other. And I'm gonna give you a characteristic. And if you think I'm talking about reptiles, you can wave to that side of the screen. And if you think I'm talking about amphibians, you can wave to that side of the screen. Okay, first one. Who has, let's see, just a second, the dry skin with scales and they can live far from water. So who's got the scaly skin? Go ahead and wave to whatever side of the screen you think I'm talking about. And these are the reptiles, way to go. The amphibians actually have moist skin and no scales. Woo! So since we had a little workout for our minds there, I thought it would be fun to do some little exercises and workouts sometimes through our program to get us moving. So I ask that you always pay attention to our instructions, stay safe, and make sure you're not be, you're being mindful and not bumping into anybody. So let's see what our first workout's gonna be. And this is totally optional, but if you want to join me in three jumping jacks, let's do it. I'm gonna find a nice open space. And one, two, and three. Okay, let's continue with our workout. Let's see, this is a neat characteristic. Who can breathe through their gills, lungs, or their skin? That's amazing. 
Who do you think? Take a moment, wave. These are the amphibians. Reptiles are only breathing through their lungs, like us. Okay, let's see what our workout's gonna be. All right, oh, let's do four arm circles. One, two, three, and four. All right, here we go. Next characteristic. Who has soft jelly-like eggs laid in water? Reptiles or amphibians? These are the amphibians. The reptiles lay dry, have dry eggs on land. And to kind of go along with that, which group has babies that look like little adults, meaning no metamorphosis, no huge changes? Hmm. These are the reptiles. No metamorphosis, and the amphibians do have metamorphosis. Woo! That was a great workout, everybody. If you want, you can stand up like me, and we can do a little jog in place for six seconds. Okay, ready? Got my space. One, two, three, four, five, six. Awesome. So let's jump right in with our first group of amphibians, the frog and the toad. Now this is a, gives you a sense of one of our beautiful freshwater habitats in Acadia National Park. I love to visit places like this. And there are six types of frogs that live here in Acadia. They're not all the same size like this. I just made them like that in the picture so that you can see them more clearly. Now, the first one I'm gonna talk about is this one right here. This is the bullfrog. And the bullfrogs are actually the largest type of frog in the entire United States. Uh, with their legs out, they can be about eight inches. Now, I want you to notice that yellow throat on this one. The bullfrogs that have a yellow throat area yeah, those are the males and if they're kind of white coloration right there those are the females now on the males they actually have what's called a vocal sac that can come out and inflate like a balloon you can do that with your hands like me what they do is they breathe in and they close off their nostrils and move the air between their lungs and their vocal sac and it helps their croaking sounds that they make get amplified. That means that helps their sounds get louder because the males are the ones singing and they want that sound to go far. So those vocal sacs really help with that. Now, when we think about frogs, they do go through huge changes called metamorphosis. So the eggs are laid and they're covered with a protective jelly-like substance to keep them wet and protected from predators. They're going to start growing within here. And when they hatch out, they actually look like little fish, little tadpoles. So this is a big clue. There's a big metamorphosis going on because they look very different than the adults. They're gonna start growing some appendages, little arms and legs and eventually they'll lose the tail and become the adult. A bullfrog takes about two years to go through this whole metamorphosis. So the next type of frog in Acadia looks kind of like a bullfrog, but it's not as big. It's called a green frog, and they have a really interesting call. It's one of the most common sounds I hear in the park, and it sounds like someone's playing the banjo, which is like a guitar. So you can all play the air banjo with me if you want. It kind of sounds like this. Dang, 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 dang. It's a really fun sound. Now, when you look at the little circle behind the eye of a frog, that is called a tympanum. Everybody feel your ears. They don't have outside ears like us. They have those circles and they're kind of like a drum. The tympanums don't actually hear the sound, but they process or they move the sound waves through that space so that the sound can be processed within. Now the next type of frog has great camouflage. It is called a pickerel frog. Now these frogs have a great sound. Everybody take your hands and imagine that you're sleeping. It's still morning. Maybe everyone's a little tired and maybe you've ever heard this sound before. Like a little snore. That's what their sound is like. Now they do have to stay moist because they don't have those protective scales on the outside. So all these animals are gonna be in moist places like lakes and ponds and little streams. And you can see all the little green plants in the water. The tadpoles are gonna to love to eat food like that. And the adults are going to be carnivores. So they're gonna be eating meat. Now, these are some animals that actually are the predators of the frog. And you can kind of act these out with me. We have fox, 
We have raccoon, fish, turtle, and birds. So not only are frogs important predators, they're also important prey in a balanced food web. Now the gray tree frog has some amazing camouflage. Let me circle it here in case it's difficult to see. And they can actually turn green as well. And these are a little different than the other frogs we were talking about in that they like to climb trees. And if you looked at the underside of their toe pads, they're actually uh, very sticky and that helps them hold on to the bark. I'm gonna zoom in even closer on this toe pad and you can see where the sticky mucus would come out of their toe. Now the spring peeper is one of the first sounds we hear here in the spring and these are very small frogs about an inch and a half and you have a beautiful chorus of them singing out here peep, 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 which is really fun. Another early spring frog is the wood frog and they're kind of interesting in that they like to live down on the moist forest floor and they're famous because they're really good at dealing with really cold weather. They can live in places even colder than where I am in Maine. They can even live up in Alaska and when they're hibernating they can actually deal with all that freezing temperature. Some of their body parts actually freeze but they're able to deal with that. Now, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the different vocal sacs of some different types of frogs. So we have the spring peeper um, on the left, and they have one big vocal sac that helps make the sound louder. But look at the wood frog. It has a pair of vocal sacs. So it made me think, I wonder if frogs around the world have a big diversity of vocal sacs, and it might be fun to look at. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and you just point to your screen and point out your favorite one in the picture. So interesting. Now, I do want to mention the toad. Now, toads are a little bit different than frogs. Um, they are technically in the frog group, but when we speak of toads commonly, we think of them as their separate characteristics and that they are drier, they are bumpier, and their eggs are laid more in these long strings. All right, everybody, it is time for our first chat and draw. So I want you to grab your piece of paper and pencil. And what I'm gonna do, um, for mine, I want my four drawings to be on one page. So I'm gonna draw a big line down the middle and a big line across, so I have four squares. If you like bigger drawings and you wanna do drawings on different pieces of paper, that's fine too. But if you want them to all kind of end up on the same page, that is awesome as well. So what I'm gonna do is pull up a, a, a kind of a guide for you to look at, to see, hold on just a moment. There we go. Um, to give you some ideas of how you might want to do your chat and draw. So you can follow along with something like this where you add and keep adding to the same drawing like that. Or you can look at these frogs that I've put in the corner and you can just be inspired by them and do your own sketch. So you can do whatever you want. This is your frog. It can be based on a real frog or an imaginary frog, but this is our first chat and draw. And you can actually, if you want to put some questions or ideas in the chat box, that is fine as well. We usually take a couple minutes for each chat and draw and then we will move on to our next group. If I don't get to your question during each chat and draw, I'll get to them at some later ones. You can always add a little habitat or some extra frog friends in your frog drawing. But I usually do about two to three minutes per chat and draw, and we'll have four of them total. Well, uh, Park Ranger Lisa, while people are drawing, do you want to take a question or two that has come in? Yes, that would be wonderful. Let's use that time to do that. Perfect. Okay, so the first question we have is, how did you, uh, how do you know all of this information? 
Thank you for your question. I do a lot of studying to learn this information. First of all, when I was a kid, I love learning about animals. So I've been reading books about animals for a very long time. And then when I decided to create a program about reptiles and amphibians, the first thing I did was went to the library and I got some great books. Um, I did some research online as well. And I also talked to some of the scientists in the park who work more closely with some of the animals and have more insight maybe uh, with some of the animals that are specifically in the park. So it's a lot of teamwork, a lot of fun reading. And then I take my time to kind of put it all together and um, hopefully share it in a fun way. But I just think it's really fun to learn. And I'm glad that that's part of my job. Great. All right, here's one more. Um, are you ever afraid of any of the reptiles in the park? Thank you so much for your question. So I'm actually not really afraid of any of the reptiles in the park. Part of my job as an education ranger is to um, explain to people how to uh, explore the park safely and to let them know that the animals are wild. So we always just keep a safe distance from them. Of course, if an animal felt threatened or somebody was trying to touch it, um, it would either try to escape or defend itself. But if we follow that, um, that safety rule of keeping a safe distance, I've never had or seen any issues. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank so you. now those are the questions we have. Perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to move on to our next group of animals here. Let me bring this up. Hold on just a second. Oops. I apologize. Things got a little. Give me just one moment. Just a little screen freeze. Give me just a second. Sorry about that. I, my apologies. Let me. Worries. I had a little uh, freeze here on the screen. Let me just pull this. Everybody can keep working on their frogs. Back up. Okay, here we go. I've got it. It should. There we go. Okay, everybody, we are moving on to our salamanders, another group of amphibians. So the most common type that we have here is the red-backed salamander. And they are very interesting animals, and they're very unique for amphibians in that they don't go in the water. Uh, they spend their time on land, and they even have their eggs on land. But they really like to live in moist places. Uh, those red-backed salamanders, along with these two on the screen, are also special in that they breathe through their skin. Can you imagine breathing through your skin? Now, this animal on the top actually likes to live down by the rocky stream, and this one on the bottom likes to live down in the fluffy, wet moss. So I'm wondering, let's have a little imagination time. Do you think it would be more fun uh, to spend the day alongside a rocky stream or down in the moss? So go ahead and wave to the side of the screen where you would want to live if you were a salamander. Today, I think I'm in the mood to live in the moss. Now, this is another type of salamander called the Eastern Newt. And what I'm showing you is the larvae. That's like the baby. You can see it has those fluffy gills at the base of the head, and that's how they breathe underwater. And they might live in a pond such as this. Now, when they are swimming around as larvae, they are eating lots of small bugs like mosquitoes. Look at that. You can hardly see it on your screen. Let me zoom in on a baby mosquito. There it is. They actually start their life in the water before they change into a flying insect. So that's one of the favorite food of the salamanders. Now, they hatch out as larvae in the water, but now they have to go through a big change. So you can count down to metamorphosis with me if you like. Here we go. Three, two, one. Metamorphosis. 
Let's see what they turned into. Wow, totally different. This is the Easter Newt juvenile phase. So juvenile is more like the bigger kid or teenager. And they're called the red Fs and they now live on land. And they have this bright orange color, which is a warning that they're somewhat poisonous. And they, when I see a picture of them, I always think that it looks like they're doing that exercise called a plank which is like a push-up, but you don't go up and down. So I thought to myself, that might be fun to imagine that we are salamanders. And if you want, uh, you can try a newt plank with me where your legs are out, your arms are under your arms are underneath your shoulders and you hold the position for three seconds. You want to make sure there's no sharp coffee tables or anything right in your area and that you have enough space and there's no toes on anyone's fingers. But if you want to try the salamander newt plank, woo, you are welcome to. It's kind of fun to imagine and play when we are learning about animals. Ready? If you haven't done it yet, here we go. One, two, three. All right, so we've got more metamorphosis to go. Everybody, you know what to do for the countdown. Three, two, one, metamorphosis. Now it's turned into this. This is the adult and now they live back in the water. So look at all these huge changes just for one individual. Now, oh, hello. This is interesting. What are these mammals doing here in my reptiles and amphibians talk? Well, it looks like these are some animals that either create tunnels underground or live in tunnels underground where our next salamander also likes to live. And these are our largest ones called the spotted salamanders. They're up to 10 inches, almost the length of a ruler. And they also like to live under the fallen leaves and decaying logs as well. Here are some of the favorite food items of the spotted salamander. And I wonder how they grab them. Well, let's see. They can use their long, sticky tongue. Pretty interesting. Now, everybody, you can imagine you're resting again because our salamanders have been sleeping and hibernating all winter. But when we get some warm weather, and when I say warm, I mean up in the mid 40s and a few days of rain, these salamanders are gonna wake up from their hibernation. Now, I want to show you the difference between frog eggs and salamander eggs because the spring is the season we're going to start seeing these. They look very similar in that they are kind of like these individual jelly blobs, but look down at the salamander legs. Let me highlight this for you. The salamander eggs have an extra outer layer of jelly that the frog eggs don't. Now, this is different than the jelly you might put on your sandwich. It's just a jelly-like material that keeps them safe. So sometimes I find eggs in the park and I try to identify them. All right, everybody, it's time for a chat and draw. So you know what to do. Grab your piece of paper and pencil and you can now either follow along or you can do freestyle for your salamander. You are welcome to put a question or comment in the chat and our host um, can ask that during our chat and draw. So let's take uh, two to three minutes to work on our salamanders. Ranger Lisa, I have a couple questions for you. All right. The first one is, are frogs and salamanders awake more at night or in the daytime? Could you say that one more time? Sure. Are frogs and salamanders awake more at night or in the daytime? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I have heard them, I have heard the frog singing um, throughout the day, but I do tend to hear more in the nighttime. In fact, and when our salamanders become more active, um, they are actually gonna start waking up and really moving around looking for bodies of water to lay their eggs. And they're gonna be doing this more at night. You know, it's interesting, most animals on earth are nocturnal, uh, more active at night where there's a little more uh, sh a little more cool weather and protection from predators. But I will say I like to go on bike rides near the ponds during the day and I will hear the, the males croaking then as well. Thank you. And the next question, how long do frogs live? 
Oh, great question. So it really depends on the species and how much food source that they have. Um, let me check on, let's see if I have here, I wanna look up how much the, how long the bullfrog can live and I will let you know. And I want to, hold on just a second. I am gonna do a quick pause here. And we can take one more question. Anybody else have questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. Those are the ones we had for right now. Perfect. Oh, and I do have here the toad I know can live to be over 25 years old. So pretty long lived. That's fun. All Thank right, you. everybody. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm done. Thank you. Wonderful. Now, remember, students, what we're doing for chat and draws is just getting the, the main outline of our animal. And I'm going to really encourage you to add more details and colors later on. But we have so much to learn about because we are moving along to our next set of animals. The reptiles, but I've got a little break here. Let's see, I got a clock. What time is it? Hold on, let me check my clock. What time is it? Oh, I know what time it is. It's turtle time. So I think we need a little dance break, if you don't mind. I've got my little turtle friend here. I really love learning about turtles. We have two types of turtles here in Acadia National Park. And if you wanna join along with me, here's how the song goes. You hold up your hand like you have a watch on and you tap it gently and you say, what time is it? And then you hold up your hands like this and you can go, it's turtle time, okay? So we'll do a few rounds of that to get us into our reptiles. Here we go. Five, six, seven, eight. What time is it? It's turtle time. What time is it? It's turtle time. What time is it? It's turtle time. All right, let's see what turtles live here in Acadia. Well, we do have a very large turtle called the common snapping turtle. Uh, the larger adults can be about the size of a watermelon. Uh, they are born with that shell. It, the shell has about 60 bones in it. It's connected to them. It grows with them and it acts like a great protection. These snapping turtles are eating all sorts of things. They can eat animals. They like to eat plants, dead plants, all sorts of things. Now, this would be another one of those great freshwater habitats habitats that you might see a, a turtle swimming around or sitting up and basking in the sun. And I wanted to bring up some ping pong pictures. I wonder if anybody out there likes to play ping pong. I love to play ping pong. And I found out that the eggs of the snapping turtle are around close to the same size as a ping pong ball. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, those turtles are going to be coming out of the water to dig a hole and lay their eggs on dry land. So very different than the amphibians. And then when they hatch out, they can go back and go swimming in the water. This is a very young common snapping turtle. Now, we also have the Eastern Painted Turtle. This is our second type of turtle. You can see the beautiful yellows and reds, and their nickname is the Sun Turtle because they are known to sit out in the sun warming up for four, five, six hours a day, especially after that long winter of hibernating and being down in the mud. Uh, they are ectothermic. Remember, that means that their body temperature is controlled by that outside temperature. So so they're going to sit up and really warm up their bodies. Okay, everybody, it is time for a chat and draw. So it's time for some turtle drawing and you know what to do. Follow that draw along um, or be inspired by these pictures. You're welcome to ask a question or if you want to share a comment like what's your favorite reptile or amphibian or what's your favorite kind of turtle? Whatever you like, but enjoy your drawing. I was just drawing my turtle, um, Lisa, but I have one question. Do turtles hibernate? Oh, great question. Yes, they do some sort of hibernation. Um, 
up here in the northern areas. Now, this is going to be different because turtles live all over the place. So if you're down in Florida, it's going to be a different story. But it gets very cold up here. Um, you know, it can be 20 degrees, 10 degrees, below zero. So they are not active in the winter. And they can actually go down into uh, a, a pond and kind of hunker down in the mud to insulate them. And they have skin that's sticking out different areas of their shell and they are able to kind of soak in oxygen from the water through parts of their skin um, to help them survive. So a lot of animals out here in Acadia in the winter are doing one of three things. They're kind of uh, staying here and being active, they're staying here and, and hunkering down, or they're migrating somewhere else. But um, it's springtime now and I really look forward to, to seeing all the animals out and active again. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we are almost to our final group of animals here. Let's see who it is. The snakes. I really enjoy learning about snakes. Now, here's a picture of one of our beautiful birch forests in Acadia. Now, here in the park, we have five types of snakes. Now, none of the snakes where I work in Acadia National Park are venomous, um, and that means you might hear part of the word not poisonous, but these are non-venomous snakes. Now, I want to be clear that these could be different snakes than what where you live, but where I am up here on the coast of Maine, we have five types of non-venomous snakes. So here is the first one, the most common one, but they have great camouflage. See if you can find it and kind of trace it out in the air with your finger. They really blend in well. These are called the common garter snakes. And all of these snakes are pretty special in that they can reach out with their forked tongue. Forked means that it splits up at the end. And you might have heard people say before, a snake smells with their tongue. And that's somewhat true, but they're actually using their tongue as a collecting device. The tongue picks up smell chemicals from the ground or the air and then it brings the tongue back into the mouth and you see that little pink blob, that's called the Jacobson's organ. So when the tongue goes inside of there, those smell chemicals, the code, it's kind of, it's decoded and sent to the brain so that the animal knows what it is sensing. Now, the next snake we have is the Eastern milk snake. They do not drink milk, uh, but they are carnivores. They are meat eaters, just like all the other snakes. This is the red belly snake. Now everybody feel your ears again. They also do not have outer ears, but they're really good at feeling vibrations in their lower jaws because their jaws are right there on the ground and they can kind of feel it. This is the ring neck snake. They also have a colorful belly and these snakes will kind of flash that colorful belly at potential predators as a warning because bright colors can signify danger. So if you look at these animals, they actually, if you look at their eyes, you cannot see any eyelids. They cannot blink their eyes, but they do have something like a goggle uh, that protects their eye. And I'll show you that soon. Uh, finally, we have the smooth green snake. Now, all of these snakes have scales. Now, if any of you go fishing, these are different than fish scales. Um, these are reptile scales and they're flexible and they overlap and everybody feel your fingernails. Our fingernails are made out of a protein called keratin. That's what turtle shells are made of and snake scales and they are basically folds in the outer layer of skin. And as the animal starts to grow, they're gonna need to shed those, but no worries, they've already produced some fresh ones underneath that are larger. So here is a snake that has started to shed by kind of uh, moving its chin along a rough surface and broken open the scales. You can see that circle scale, that's the scale that covers the eye and acts like a protective goggle. Uh, they will then kind of wiggle out of that and it can take a while, but it's like taking a sock off inside out and it doesn't always come off in one piece, but 
underneath, they will have a fresh set of scales. Um, and they're not separate from the body. They're right there against the skin. And they're very shiny because they're new and they're a little bit bigger. So here's what we might find in the park after a snake has shed. Okay, everybody, it is time for our final chat and draw. There we go. We are on our snake. I wonder if any of you have seen any of those types of snakes before. Some of these snakes have very large ranges and they might be in many different states. Uh, some might be uh, more in one area in the country than others. While people are drawing, here's a couple questions for you. What is your favorite snake? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, I really enjoy learning about snakes. I'm going to say that I like that milk snake. Oh, that's actually the one on the bottom of the screen right now. Uh, there are, they are our largest snakes, so they can get to be, you know, I've seen some that are a couple feet long, and I think that their coloration is really beautiful, and I do see those a lot. When it's warm out, I probably have, I see maybe one or two snakes a week, uh, maybe sitting out and getting warm in the sun. But I will say a lot of times they're so well camouflaged, I don't see them, and but they sense me before I sense them and they kind of wiggle away from me um, when I'm hiking on a trail or something. But I always keep a nice safe distance from them, but I'm gonna go with the milk snake. Okay, and then on a similar in a similar vein, I got the question, what is your favorite type of turtle? Oh, my favorite turtle. I really love the painted turtle. I love seeing them out on the rock, just enjoying that sunshine. And I love the beautiful colors on them. I think they're just incredible. So I really, I really like seeing the reptiles and amphibians out here and learning about them and learning how to identify them by sight and by sound. It's really fun. Okay, thank you. Those are the questions that came in. All right, so students, I'm gonna wrap up with a few more pictures here. You can continue drawing if you like, but I wanna kind of bring it full circle to what I talked about in the beginning about how I'm a park ranger at, at a national park. And there's over 400 national parks across the uh, country. And here are some habitat pictures here in Acadia. And when I look at these, it's pretty incredible to think about how many incredible plant and animal species rely on these various habitats um, for places to grow and to find food and to live their lives. These are just spectacular habitats and I'm really happy that we have all of these incredible national parks where so many animals can hopefully find a home sweet home. So I'm going to stop my slideshow here. I hope you had fun doing the drawings. And if we have a couple minutes left, um, we can now move on to just any general questions about Acadia or any of the animals that we talked about that maybe uh, you didn't get a chance to um, ask your question yet. So feel free to let our hosts know via the chat. And I do want to let you know that I checked on the um, the bullfrog uh, about seven to 10 years of age, but it might be different in different parts of the country. Terrific. Okay, so here's here's a couple questions that I can just kind of give to you at the same time. One is, do you like being a park ranger? And the second is, how did you get to be a park ranger? Oh, yes, I like being a park ranger so much. And it's because it combines two things that I really love. One is being able to explore nature. Being outside in nature makes me feel good and calm, and I find it so fun and interesting. And the other big part of my job is creating opportunities for other people to make those connections with these wild spaces. So every single day, whether it's in person out on a trail or virtually, I get to interact um, with and meet new people all the time. So I really enjoy doing that. Um, I became a park ranger. I, I worked here in Acadia for about 22 years or so, um, but I grew up um, really loving to learn about animals and I studied a lot of marine biology and I went to college and I studied sciences and I started volunteering and also working at summer camps and nature centers 
and I got a lot of experience doing outdoor education. And then I got my first national park ranger job actually in Florida at the Everglades National Park. There are other types of rangers out in Acadia as well, though. We have police officer rangers and firefighter rangers who have their own special training. We have maintenance rangers who have very specialized training because some of them are stonemasons, electricians, plumbers, car mechanics. The scientist rangers are really specialized on what type of research they're doing. So it's great that there's a lot of different roles that different rangers play and come from a lot of different experiences. Fantastic. Okay, next one is what's the biggest snake in Acadia? And then I think you touched on this earlier, but they ask what is the most venomous snake in Acadia? Ah, so the biggest snake is the milk snake. And the, the, the largest I've seen them is about three feet long, but I think they can get to be closer, um, close to four feet, but usually two to three feet for a milk snake. Uh, when I was in Florida, there were definitely longer snakes. And here in Acadia, we have zero venomous snakes. Um, so I've lived in the Carolinas, lots of places where there are venomous snakes, uh, such as cottonmouth, copperhead, and rattlesnakes, but none of those live where I am on the coast of Maine. Thank you for your question. Okay, and the next one is, did you draw these step-by-step -step drawings for us to use? Were, the, were those your drawings with, for the chat and draws? Oh, good question. No, those were not my drawings. I, I did try to do some of those drawings, but I found that um, finding some artist renditions of them would be more clear than what I could draw. Great question. That Those are fun to follow along. If you're into drawing, I think that's a neat way to, um, to help other people draw is to give some ideas out to people. So yeah, good question. Lisa, that, those are the questions. I'll do one last final call for them. And while we're just waiting to see if anybody else has a question, I'll just say thank you so much. This was a really fun program. I enjoyed doing all the movements and doing all the drawings during the program. And uh, thanks to all of the, the students who tuned in today on spring break for this program. And I don't see any other questions come in. So I'll let you have the final word. All right. Well, I just want to thank all of you so much uh, for sharing your time with me to learn about our incredible national parks and how they are homes to so many animals and we protect and preserve so many incredible resources here. And it was amazing to spend the morning with you all and I wish you all a great day from Acadia.